Well, good good morning. Welcome to worship on this third Sunday after Pentecost. I'm so glad to be with you all today, Uh, whether you're here in the building or joining us online for worship, I'm really glad that you could be here today, and a special welcome to anybody who might be joining us for the first time today. Um, Really glad to have you with us. If you are worshiping online, you can download a worship bulletin with the order of service from the link in the video description below. As we gather this morning, we remember that we are gathered on the homelands of the Squababsh, who are the Swiftwater people. They are members of the Spialapops, the Puyallup Nation. The Spialapops have lived on the shores of what we now call the Southern Puget Sound for thousands of years, faithfully stewarding these lands and waters as they continue to do today. Um, Everybody should have signed in for contact tracing as you entered. Uh, If you didn't, I hope you do before you leave. Just, uh, we have had a few potential exposures, no spreading events, but we have had a few exposures the last couple weeks and so we can let you know if that becomes an issue. Um, masks are optional uh, but encouraged throughout the sanctuary but we do have a section over here for um, uh, reserved for masked folks which is getting rather full these days we might be expanding so Um, as we begin our worship I'll invite us to take a moment to share any prayer requests that we might have Um, if you're online you can share those prayers of concern or gratitude in the chat or in the comments being mindful of privacy are there oh uh, Marlene Oh my, all right. Marlene's uh, neighbor, uh, yeah, the neighbor's wife had a heart attack and died last night, so yeah, pray, pray for their family. Thank you. Sally. All right. Pray for Ken Watson who has cancer. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, All right, seeing no others, I'll invite us to take a moment to quiet our hearts and minds. Oh, actually, before I do that, we are are blessed with the problem of having run out of bulletins. (laughs) So if you uh, (laughs) have an extra, maybe just hold it up. And I don't know if anybody needs an extra that didn't get one. You can redistribute as needed. Oh, okay. Joanna, okay. All right. There we go. That's probably good. Uh, Okay, I think we're good. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Thanks for being willing to share, everybody. All right. Now, let's take a moment to quiet our hearts and minds for worship.
Every spring at the Easter Vigil, we uh, renew and affirm our baptism as a community, and we welcome new members into our congregation. And um, because it's the Easter Vigil, it's a Saturday night service, very frequently we don't have everybody there, but as it worked out, this year we had almost nobody there of our new members. Um, and so I wanted to uh, take the opportunity, especially now that we are all together in one service, um, to invite our new members forward and to be able to welcome them uh, if they weren't, had, didn't have that chance at Easter Vigil. So um, I'd like for us to have that opportunity to um, introduce and recognize our newest members. So I'll invite them forward with their sponsors as you're able. Um, Jen Paney, uh, along with uh, her sponsors, Marsha Ohm and Kathy Stark. And uh, Steve and Heidi Giles were sponsored by Gary and Kathy Gamer. And uh, Mark and Peter Anderson, sponsored by their folks, Chuck and Margie. If you're able to come up, great. If not, that's fine. <clears throat> so. So I'll invite uh, you all to join me as we give thanks for the gift of baptism. In baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father frees us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are born children of a fallen humanity. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are reborn children of God and made members of the Church, the body of Christ. Living with Christ in the communion of saints, we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Dear friends, today we give thanks for the gift of baptism and for these people, one with us in the body of Christ, whom we recognize as new members in this life and ministry of this congregation. Together with these siblings in Christ, let us give thanks to God for the gift of baptism. The Lord be with you. you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father. We give you thanks, for in the beginning, your spirit moved over the waters, and you created heaven and earth. By the gift of water, you nourish and sustain us and all living things. Blessed be God, now and forever. By the waters of the flood, you saved those whom you had chosen, Noah and his family. You led Israel by the pillar of cloud and fire through the sea, out of slavery and into the freedom of the promised land. In the waters of the Jordan, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, your beloved son has set us free from the power of sin and death and has opened the way to the joy and freedom of everlasting life. He made water a sign of the kingdom and of cleansing and rebirth. In obedience to his command, we make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit, that those who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. Wash away the sin of all those who are cleansed by this water and bring them forth as inheritors of your glorious kingdom. To you be given praise and honor and worship through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. These new members of our congregation have affirmed their baptismal covenant and expressed their desire to walk with this community in the life of faith. Let us once again welcome them into this fellowship of Christ followers. We rejoice with you in the life of baptism. Together we will give thanks and praise to God and proclaim the good news to all the world. Thank you. Let's welcome them with a round of applause. I invite you all to please rise as you are able as we join together in our opening hymn.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Sovereign God, ruler of all hearts, you call us to obey you and you favor us with true freedom. Keep us faithful to the ways of your Son, that leaving behind all that hinders us, we may steadfastly follow your paths through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading this morning is from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15 through 16 and 19 through 21. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king of Aram. Also you shall anoint Jeho, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat of Abel Malol as prophet in your place. So he set out from there and found Elijah, son of Shaphat, who was plowing. Now there were twelve yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. He left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Then Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen, and slaughtered them. Using the equipment from the oxen, he boiled the flesh. And he gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. This is the word of God, word of life. Thank you to God. reading is from Galatians chapter 5. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. 
Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the sp- desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. But the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, Let us also be guided by the Spirit. Word of God, Word of Life. Gospel according to St. Luke, the ninth chapter. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they encountered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but those did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. No one who looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Ouch. Does that sound kind of harsh to you? I wonder as I read this, if Jesus' words leave you wondering if you are fit for the kingdom of God. Maybe this passage leaves you feeling anxious or worried, or maybe it makes you defensive or offended. Maybe you just don't like it very much and it, because it doesn't sound like the Jesus you know. Any of those reactions might be evidence of a seed of doubt somewhere deep inside about your own fitness, or not. But personally, I wonder if maybe that's the question the story wants us to ask. See, the story starts by putting us in context. The days were drawing near for Jesus to be taken up. And knowing that those days are drawing near, Jesus' response is to set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now, St. Luke isn't giving us a travel log. He's not just telling us about Jesus' geographic destination, but about his mission. 
his purpose. We know, right, what happens to Jesus in Jerusalem. That's where he's arrested and tried and executed and where after all of that, he's raised to life. This is the logical and inescapable conclusion of Jesus' ministry. He has come to proclaim the good news of God to a world that resists hearing it. And that can only mean that violence is going to happen. And when it does, he's going to be on the receiving end, not the giving end. That particular point, it seems, is lost on his disciples. When this Samaritan village refuses to receive Jesus, perhaps for the same reasons that the city of Jerusalem itself refused to receive him, James and John's first instinct is to call down fire from heaven to consume these infidels, like the prophet Elijah once did. Does that fit with the Jesus we see in Jerusalem? Of course not. His face may be set on Jerusalem, but it sounds like maybe his disciples aren't quite there yet. Their faces seem to be set elsewhere. To drive this point home, St. Luke then shares three encounters between Jesus and other would-be disciples. The reader might even imagine But after having been shocked and appalled by the casual violence of James and John, Jesus decides that maybe it's time to institute some sort of application and vetting process for discipleship. (laughs) He makes it clear that God's kingdom requires a single-minded devotion. That having divided loyalties like selfish devotion only to oneself or one's family or one's kin group is not consistent with what God is doing. God's aim is much wider. That kind of prejudice can predispose, say, a group of Jewish disciples to want to rain fire down on a Samaritan village. I wonder if they'd have had the same response if they'd been in Judea. And this is why I hear this text asking me where my loyalties are. Am I looking ahead as I plow? Am I setting my face on Jerusalem, or are there other goals, other destinations that are competing for my attention and ruining my straight furrow? Am I looking forward to what is next, or am I looking back at what was, at what I used to know, hoping to get back there somehow? Am I following Jesus for myself, for some hope of a reward, or because I believe in the mission that's taking him to Jerusalem. I think this text challenges us to consider why anyone would want to follow Jesus. I mean, if it's this hard, if it requires that much devotion, if it costs so much, why should we bother, right? Maybe it's better to leave discipling to those holier people and remain here in our comfy homes where we can raise our families and bury our dead. That's a question that we have to wrestle with. Now, there are some who would answer that that question is all about the afterlife, right? Following Jesus now, as hard as it is, is the way to assure one's place in heaven, while failing or refusing to follow Jesus is inviting God to rain hellfire on us from heaven for eternity. Is it better to suffer through uh, uh, through this life in hope of some reward later? Personally, I find that answer not only extremely unsatisfactory, but also inconsistent with the message of Scripture. At least as inconsistent as a Jesus who calls down fire from heaven to consume Samaritan villages. I find it inconsistent because that's not what I see Jesus doing anywhere else. When he proclaims the kingdom of God, it's not something for later. It's something for now. In fact, his very first sermon in Matthew's and Mark's gospel accounts is repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And in Luke, it's not much different. Today, these words have been fulfilled in your hearing. Whatever this kingdom of God is, and that is a question that we will investigate for the rest of the year as we read through Luke's gospel, whatever that kingdom of God is, it is not limited 
to what happens when we die. And that's what St. Paul notices as well. He describes the kingdom of God as freedom. For freedom, Christ has set us free. He writes, You were called to freedom, so do not use that freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. He goes on to say that we can see what our own self-indulgent freedom looks like, right? Where that freedom takes us. The works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, etc., etc. Paul sees that the problems of the world, the problems that we hope to escape in heaven, are the very results of our divided loyalties and our lack of commitment to this path to which God calls us. Can heaven really be free of all those things if they just follow us there? For both Jesus and Paul, salvation is less about gaining entrance to some kingdom than it is about turning or perhaps about being turned away from those things that cause us to bite and devour one another until we are consumed. But it's not a turning away, not really. It's more of a turning toward. It's having our faces set on Jerusalem, as Luke says, or as Paul, what Paul calls living according to the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, he says, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That sounds to me a lot more like what we think of when we think of heaven, doesn't it? I hear these texts challenging us to consider what discipleship means for us, both individually and as a community. Are we living according to the Spirit or according to the flesh? Are we following God's path or are we trying to blaze our own? Are our faces set on Jerusalem or on one of those other things that we think will make us happy? Is discipleship just about hanging on to some doctrinal statement? Or is it also about letting go of some of those other priorities that pull us away from where God is calling us? If these stories do cause you some anxiety about whether or not you're fit for God's kingdom, that challenge may not be exactly a comforting thought. But again, I wonder if that's the point. As the old saying goes, the gospel comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable, right? And yet I think there is good news in this challenge at least in part because it assures us that salvation isn't some reward that God dangles in front of us to bribe us into moral living. It's an ongoing process of creation in which God continually invites us to participate. Salvation is the work of a God who is constantly turning our faces towards Jerusalem and the fruit of the Spirit. Maybe I'm not fit for the kingdom of God today but tomorrow is a new day. Think about these unnamed people in our story. We're never told how each of these encounters resolves. We don't know whether these folks follow Elisha's example and burn all their bridges to follow Jesus, or whether they return to their lives and give up the dream of discipleship. Let's say for the sake of argument that that's what they do, that they go home dejected and figure that this is not what they're called to. That's what happens today, but what happens after Easter? Might some of these folks been among the 3,000 who joined the church on Pentecost? Or maybe some of them were among the believers who were baptized in Samaria. In my experience, we tend to think of salvation in dualistic terms. You're either saved or unsaved, a believer or a doubter. This story makes me wonder if it's not that simple. Having set his face on Jerusalem, Jesus still has a long road to travel to get there, doesn't he? This story is in chapter 9. There are 10 more chapters before Jesus even gets to Jerusalem. The story's not even half over yet, folks. 
the bulk of this gospel story takes place not at one point, at one end or another of this journey, but along the road. It's Jesus' journey to Jerusalem that gets the most ink because that's where the action is. That's where all the living happens. That journey has its climax and its grounding at what happens at its destination, but all along that road there is life and growth and epiphany and movement and, I would say, salvation. And so would Luke. In the Acts of the Apostles, which is St. Luke's sequel to his gospel story, he records that the community formed by the Spirit after Pentecost, that community of Jesus' friends and disciples, is called the Way. That Greek word, way, is the same one used in that phrase, along the road. Whenever we read along the road or on the way, it's sort of an allusion to being on the way with Jesus, a part of this community. In fact, even Jerusalem, in a sense, is just one stop along a much larger journey that this gospel is taking. A journey embodied in that community, in this community. One might even say that the journey is the destination, that along the road is where we're trying to get to. In fact, it makes me wonder whether heaven, as we have classically understood it, is really what salvation is, or if maybe salvation is something else entirely, something that we experience in anticipation of heaven. Perhaps grace is most visible in these stories in that God keeps seeking out and inviting people who are not fit for the kingdom to leave behind what holds them back, including, I might add, people like James and John and Peter, Peter of the threefold denial, remember him? Maybe rather than condemnation, this story of Luke stands as an invitation for us to consider what is holding us back from following Jesus and to put that in perspective, to think about how important is that in light of the alternative to which God continues to invite us. The works of the flesh are obvious, political polarization Overconsumption, persecution, fear, violence, greed, xenophobia, racism, an unsustainable and exploitative lifestyle that undervalues God's good creation, that list goes on, right? What are other things that go on that list? Now, as we look across the chasm from where we are to where we'd like to be, as we envision the just and peaceful world that God is creating, I wonder, can we start to see where some of those fleshy things may be keeping us from making the leap from here to there? Or at least setting out along the road to get there? The promise of Scripture is that this world that we envision, the one that I think sometimes we confuse with heaven, that's the world God is creating. That's the world that lies at the end of this road. That is our destination. There is no avoiding it. All roads lead there. And so I wonder, if we know that that's where God is taking us all eventually, I wonder if that might give us the courage, or at least the strength to ponder what it takes to set aside those things that are holding us back and to get going along that road as God sets our faces on the new Jerusalem.
As our hearts burn within us and the gospel works on us, I invite you to please stand as you are able and join me in responding to this good news with our hymn, number 584 in your red hymn. That's on me. I forgot what was happening next. <laughs> um, today, as part of this congregation's ministry, we'll be installing uh, council members for the new year, as well as uh, board members for our Little Lambs Preschool. And so um, I will invite the following people to come forward as, uh, as I call their names uh, to the front so we can see who they are. Um, newly elected to council this year, or, yeah, please be seated. Sorry. <laughs> I'm still running on a sleep debt, so I apologize. Um, newly elected or re-elected to our council this year are Linda Olson and Gary Gamer and Linda Ryberry. If you want to just stand up and uh, come forward. Uh, they will serve alongside current members, uh, Lynette Brenton, Marlene Bridgeforth, Marilyn Collier, who's joining us online today. Hi, Marilyn. Charlene Franz, Richard Ohm, Denny Sapp, and Sherry Staba. In addition, uh, these people have been elected by our congregation to serve on the board of our Little Lambs Preschool. Sue Horton, Sally Middleton, and Kathy Adair. They will serve alongside current members Jerry Meldy, Nancy Johnson, and Echo Park. 
It is with joy and gratitude that we also recognize our outgoing council members, Jean Keast and Susan Whitney. You want to stand up and say hi? And our outgoing uh, Little Lambs board members, Rob Powers and Margaret Duncan. We thank them for their service to this community and for the time and effort and energy that they have dedicated to the work of Christ in this place. We give our thanks also for their willingness to serve, and we now rejoice that these siblings will continue to lead us in this important ministry that our congregation has in caring for raising up and children, raising up and caring for the children of our community. St. Paul writes, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each of us is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Church council and preschool board members, you have been elected to hold positions of leadership and trust in this community, in this congregation. You are to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith bear witness to God, who gathers us into one together with the whole church. You are to seek to involve all members of this congregation in worship, learning, witness, service, and support so that the mission of Christ is carried out in this congregation, in the wider church, in this community, and in the whole world. You are to be faithful to your specific area of serving, that the spirit who empowers you may be glorified. You are to be examples of faith active in love, fostering peace, harmony, mutual understanding, in this congregation. On behalf of your siblings in Christ, I ask you, will you accept and faithfully carry out the duties of the offices to which you have been elected? If so, you can respond, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. People of God, I ask you to voice your commitment to these, our siblings in Christ. Will you support these, our elected leaders, and will you share in the mutual ministry that Christ has given to all who are baptized? I now declare you installed as members of the Church Council and the Little Lambs Preschool Board for this congregation. Almighty God, bless you and direct your ways and deeds in peace, that you may be faithful servants of Christ. Amen. Thank you. There we go. I invite you to rise as you're able for the prayers. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. God of faithfulness, set the face of your church firmly on you. Rooted in your self-giving love, may the church find freedom and joy in loving our neighbors. God of grace, God of gentleness, strengthen the earth's ability to heal. Where there are dangerous storms, bring calm. Where there are destructive fires, bring rain. Protect homes, habitats, and livelihoods threatened by climate disasters, especially Yellowstone National Park and the surrounding areas. God of grace. God of peace, guide all who govern, that they may place the good of their citizens above self-promotion. Without ceasing, we pray for the people of Ukraine. Anoint leaders of nations with your spirit of neighborly love. Protect refugees and all who live under tyranny or conflict. God of grace. God of kindness, reveal your healing presence to all who are sick or dying. Uphold those who grieve. Support the needs of any who are unemployed, hungry, or have nowhere safe to lay their heads. God of grace. God of love, attend to those struggling with addiction, depression, or uncontrolled anger. Provide support systems and loving companions as they work toward health, that they may rest in hope and know the fullness of joy in your presence. God of grace. For what and for whom do the people pray? God of grace. God of joy, we give thanks for all who have died and are now able to celebrate the inheritance of life in you, especially Dick Werner. 
Keep the examples of Dick and other beloveds who have led faithful lives always before us. We trust your promises in life and in death. God of grace. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I'll invite us to share a sign of that peace with one another. As we take our seats, our ushers will uh, bring the plates forward to receive our offering. Um, you may uh, place your offering in the plate, but you are also invited to uh, give your offering online at our website, on onustatelutheran.org slash give, or on your phone with the Tithely app. God of abundance, you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. Lift Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, 
through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God triune, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Over the eons, your merciful might evolved our home, a fragile tree of life. Here by your wisdom are both life and death, growth and decay, the nest and the hunt, sunshine and storm, darkness and light. Sustained by these wonders, we creatures of dust join in the ancient song, the earth is full of your glory. The earth is full of your glory. O God triune, you took on our flesh in Jesus, our healer. In Christ, you bring life from death. We remember his cross. We laud his resurrection. Broken like bread, he enlivens our body. Outpoured like wine, he fills the earth with goodness. Receiving this mystery, we mortals sing our song. The earth is full of your glory. The earth is full of your glory. We praise you for the heart of Jesus, so filled with your love for this earth, that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered around this table, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come again. O God, triune, you create the worlds. You uphold the living. You embrace the dead. Send forth your spirit and renew the face of the earth. Strengthen us for our journey with this meal, the body and blood of Christ. Give us a future that trusts in you and cares for your earth. Empowered by your promises, we rise from our deaths to praise you again. The earth is full of your glory. The earth is full of your glory. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Gathered into one in the spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. As we prepare to receive the meal, I would remind us that... Um, this is Christ's table where all are welcome and all are invited. If you're worshiping online, you're invited to participate in the meal with whatever elements you have uh, with you. If you are um, here in the room, we'll invite you forward. The ushers will invite you forward by row. Um, I will have the bread at the front of the table, which is gluten-free. Um, 
Here at the rear is the wine. There is red wine and white grape juice in little cups. And then uh, behind that will be a basket to receive the empty cups. Uh, you can then continue on via the rear and sides back to your seat. Uh, children are welcome and invited at the meal at the dis uh, discretion of parents. I'll just ask whether you receive, prepare, blah, whether you ref prefer there we go. Words are hard. Whether you prefer they receive bread or blessing. Our servers will be gloved and masked for everybody's safety. Um, but if you are unable or uncomfortable coming forward, um, just let our ushers know and they will let me know and we'll bring the elements back to you. If you're communing at home, hear this word of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
I invite you to please rise as you're able for the blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is abundant and eternal. Amen. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, before we conclude, I'll just uh, remind everybody to take a look at the uh, announcement section of your bulletin to see things that are coming up uh, throughout the week and as we go forward. The only thing to mention that I can think of this week is that next Sunday at 3 p.m. we'll have Dick Werner's memorial here at the church. Um, but are there other announcements we'd like to include today? All right. Then... Yeah. Yep, I'm on it. I've <laughs> Thanks for checking, though, because we can't be sure. <laughs> May the God of peace, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. Amen. I invite you to join me in our sending hymn number 551, The Spirit Sends Us Forth to Serve. Peace. Love your neighbor.